All right. And it's setting up our Facebook Live. I'll tell you when it's up. All right, Steve, I think we are live. All right. All right. So um, this is Temporary Book Club. Uh, this is our first live streaming conversation. Hopefully we'll have a few more. And I'd like to welcome our first guest, guest ever, uh, Mr. Steve Grow. Thank you for coming, Steve. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. No problem. Hey, could you uh, take a second and introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about who you are. My name's Steve Grow. Um, I know Mike because we are both teachers together at Oak Hills High School. I am the uh, art and photography teacher there, and I've been teaching at Oak Hills for about, I think I just finished my, I want to say maybe my 21st year. I've lost, I've been teaching so long, I've lost track. I was at Northwest before that. My wife is the um, special education, well, she's the, she's got a new title now, transition coordinator in the special ed department at uh, Oak Hills over there with me. And I have a, a son who's a senior and a son who's a sophomore. So the entire Grove family is over at Oak Hills. We climb into one clown car and head off to work. <laughs> and we're glad to have you. It's awesome. No, Steve has been, um, once we met, we have a lot of uh, similar ideas about a lot of things about life in general. And um, I went to Steve and asked him a while back just to give me some book recommendations. And Steve gave me this recommendation, you probably don't remember, a few years ago. I read it, and then when I went to Steve and asked him to do this, uh, this was one of the books. He gave me, I think, three options. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying it was just so funny because the, some of the options were books that, you know, most people maybe have read. I mean, I know you read tons of books, so it was just assumed that you'd read The Catcher in the Rye and Candide and some of those things. And when I threw the swerve, I kind of just threw the swerve on there because it's a book I love. So when you said, I read the swerve, I was like, what? And it was because uh, of you. <laughs> I thought that was the least likely. So yeah. Um, and it was, it was because of you. Exactly. So this is the book uh, Steve recommended and he was right on. It was a, a great book. I read it. Whenever I, I read a book, um, I kind of write in. Oh, actually, hold on one second. Alexa, set the alarm for 45 minutes. There we go. We're going to time our conversation. All right. Sounds good. Get out of hand. Um, but first thing I do with a book is when I, I get it, uh, I put in when I read this. So I have not looked at this yet. I did not know. I read it uh, January 24th of 2018. So Steve okay. said you read it about 10 years ago, right? Yeah, well, I feel like I did. I feel like it, it, it couldn't have been that long after it came out. And it, it came out in 2011, I think. Gotcha. Um, I, I, read I it wanted in to. I thought I would briefly mention that I had, um, I have briefly met Stephen Greenblatt. That this book that Mike and I are discussing was written by this uh, Harvard Humanities professor, and his I think it was his first book, uh, but his his 2005 book was called Will in the World. I see that. Um, How Shakespeare became Shakespeare, and it's also a, a great book. And he came to Cincinnati and spoke at the Mercantile Library. Oh wow! And so I went down there with my dad. And uh, because we really enjoyed that book and we went down and listened to him talk. And um, I just remember getting back in the elevator afterwards and I I've listened, I've seen a lot of, um, I love a lot of nonfiction. And so I've seen, um, you know, Jane Goodall and, and Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biologist, a lot of these people uh, talk about things. Um, but when we got back in the elevator, I said, well, my dad said, what was it that was kind of different about listening to that guy talk, Stephen. And I said, I, I think when you listen to a humanities, a Harvard humanities professor talk about Shakespeare and some of these things like in a swerve, you get the feeling that he might not only be smart, he might actually be wise, <laughs> you know, right. which, is, which is a different feeling. Like it wasn't just, I'm very knowledgeable about biology or some niche thing. It was like, these are very more, um, yeah, much more open-ended. Right. Of. Well, you know, that's funny. First of all, I did not know the will in the world. I see that written. This was his other yeah, book. Yeah, it's a good book. It was about Shakespeare. I was just speaking to Jake Richards, who, you know, on he's going to be doing a show soon. And when I mentioned this book, he said, I'm reading a book about Shakespeare. I think he wrote it. So that's right on there, too. But Yeah, that's a, that's a good book. That'll be good to discuss. 
I'll have to check it out. But the thing about him, and I think you nailed it, um, he seems to be curious unlike, I mean, all, anybody that writes a book is curious, but he seems to have the same almost curiosity I do. Um, you know, why is this important? Why do we even look at these things? I know he has another book on Adam and Eve out there. Um, okay, Adam was um, nowhere. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the name of it. So he's taken these big ideas and how these small stories have changed, you know, changed the yeah. world, changed the whole world around them. So first question, Steve, what is the swerve? So the idea of the book is about how a uh, papal bureaucrat by the name of Poggio Bracciolini in 1417, um, he's a, he works for, uh, well, he worked for a series of popes, but he goes on um, a book hunt essentially to these monasteries, German monasteries, looking for these lost books from antiquity. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of the Renaissance and, and the idea behind the book is that he comes across um, a lost copy of Lucretius's Dererum Natura, which means on the, translates to on the nature of things. And this poem uh, that Lucretius wrote is kind of based on Epicurean philosophy. And it's this idea that these guys were um, atomists, like they, they actually, even though it was ancient times, believed, um, it was kind of like a dispelling of the, the gods and all the um, superstition of the time. It was just there's atoms in the void. And when atoms bounce across each other um, in the void, sometimes they bounce into each other and leads to changes that occur. And that was the idea of the swerve. The swerve was the idea that when atoms bounce around, they can ca cause un, you know, a little bit like butterfly effect. Right, <laughs> um, but it was—it's also tied into so it's tied into this idea that um, this that that philosophy that they had is also evident in the pulling of this book out of the out of the lost mists of time out of the and, void, and yeah, out of the void itself, and then and then the book. I mean, he—he's you know he gets accused of oversimplifying things, which I think you just have to do to to write a right. good book, and he's saying that this book helped launch the renaissance um that's the basics of it, it helped yeah, launch he, this resurged interest in these humanist ideas right I, I think what i was reading is there there there's one point in the book that he said the swerve itself is that um this um, th these amazing epicurean thoughts that we'll come back to it, uh later but um this whole thought paradigm that was probably uh pretty big before christianity uh was destroyed and it, it, he almost used the word miracle he said you know it was, all, it was almost like a miracle that we found this one copy left because there were probably a lot and they were taken care of uh, on mean, purpose and because of uh natural ways these these all these copies were gone and the fact that they found the one copy of this very important work was a swerve almost like a miracle like history could have went on without that but this major change that led to possibly big things like the renaissance it allowed that those things to happen um the other swerve is actually the swerve i think that that the middle ages to the renaissance takes you know right the, the I mean, swerve of finding it and the swerve from from that revolution that was one of the things that i was unaware of that i found fascinating in the book was um, just how much we have lost from ancient antiquity and, and uh, how rare it is to, to recover these things. Like, for instance, I, I didn't know that all of the um, original, any original manuscripts, writings from antiquity, they only come from two places on the entire planet which is this Villa of the Papyri in Herculaneum. And the other one is like a rubbish heap somewhere in, in, in Egypt. In Egypt. Uh, but aside from these two archeological sites, anything that has come down to us from ancient Rome and Greece- Is copied has, from that. Is a copy a of a copy. Yeah, and the only reason Herculaneum exists is because of Mount Vesuvius, correct? Correct. It, it, it entombed these writings and saved them actually. Um, so that they wouldn't be destroyed. And uh, he, he mentions, Greenblatt mentions that 
even though, of course, the story is about this, this guy in Italy uh, retrieving this book from a monastery in Germany, he talks about how when they take these carbonized uh, scrolls, so, so this, there was this uh, villa, this wealthy villa in Herculaneum that had a bunch, had a library, had a very nice library, and the libraries at that time would have all been scrolls. And when they dug this place up in the, I want to say the 1700s, right. when they dug it up, um, they didn't even know what they had come across. They, they found these like burnt, look like bricks, almost charcoal briquettes. And when they broke them open, they realized these are scrolls. Well, there was very little you could do to retrieve them at that time. But now that we're in, you know, with modern technology, they're able to scan them and see some of the writings. And they know that in that library, they had a copy of Lucretius's On the Nature of Things in, in that actual library. So just to go back to the point, so what we know right now is that there was this writing, Lucretius wrote on the nature of things, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't even know, I can't even think of what, what time period was that, a thousand years ago? Lu Lucretius is writing um, yeah. about a hundred years before uh, BC. Right. He, he's about a hundred years BC and he's writing about Epicurean philosophy, which is about 200 years before him. Right. And so we can see that this is a, a, a pretty big philosophy. We get that from other people's writings, right? Um, and then it goes lost. Okay, we're going to come back to what these writings are, but it goes lost. What are some of the reasons this is lost uh, during the Middle uh, during the Dark Ages? Why, why do we lose all these writings that we, we can only find in these couple places? Well, first of all, just that's another thing that just uh, modern people are, uh, don't think about a lot is just the the act of writing itself was an extremely laborious process. Um, it, it was something that only the scribes, you know, only a, a very few people were literate in these ancient times. It, it only scribes could create these scrolls. They were only owned by the very wealthy. Um, I, I know that when I've read about the Renaissance in general, that prior to the printing press, which is probably about 1450 or so, Prior to the printing press, you could count all of the books in Europe in the thousands. Yeah. So there, there just were not that many right. books to, to begin with. And then you have the fall of Rome uh, and, and, you know, the vandals. Christianity. Come. The yes. rise of Christianity, you know. And, so then, and then the paganism, know. right, the rise of Christianity. I mean, some of this, this is stuff is all heretical. Right. Um, and so it's banned and... But thankfully, like there's this kind of weird dichotomy to the, to the Christian system where they, well, it, it was the idea of the book itself and scribes, like just to keep a scribe in practice, they needed something to copy. Something and to copy the, and something to read. That was and since in the job. early days of Christianity, there weren't enough Christian writings to copy, they would take ancient texts and copy them. So they, in, even though they believed in these, these things were heretical in some sense, they are also, the church is largely responsible for saving them uh, too. Right. Yeah. The, mon the, the monasteries are definitely in charge of it. So you have this one group that are out there to try to destroy books that are against what they're teaching. And, in, in, you know, history, Christianity essentially ruled the world at, at that point. Uh, trying to to get rid of this but then also uh just reading in the swerve uh just uh climate water yeah all these damages over a thousand years are going to do it and then i found a very interesting section you may not remember steve but just about the actual bookworm do you remember yes writing about that? yes <laughs> was, I, I had no idea it was a real thing or anything but they talked i mean they were talking about that hey this little worm that you can barely see is eating my books <laughs> so I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's extremely fascinating too because, you know, I mean, there's just so many of these uh, elements to the, to the history of, 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 liter of writing and keeping these books that are, that are just fascinating. Like, you know, it had these scrolls like, in, like China and Egypt. They had some of the earliest writing because they had some of the first technology for creating papyrus, having the right materials to make paper i mean you know it's hard to carve things into a stone or something so they, they had paper but then later um people would do these writings on vellum uh and and vellum is this like stretched calf skin but it, it's also extremely laborious process where you had to like boil these skins scrape off the hair stretch it dry it but they would write on vellum and like you said there were these like i think it's like the larva of a beetle 
or right. something that would moth, it was a bookworm that would eat moth. through these or moth kind of yep. that would eat through these uh, books because it's organic material. So it's extreme. That's why like things like the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are pretty miraculous finds. And, and the only reason that they occur is someone has put these scrolls into a jar in a extremely climate controlled cave, essentially, with very little humidity. Um, and they've somehow weathered, yeah, weathered the, the time. But, uh, but, but yeah, it's just so easy for books to get destroyed just by nature itself. And I want to go back to your point, too, is just uh, in the book, it mentions um, when they're reading about uh, the humanities and some authors during the humanities and these authors, you know, like authors today feed off other authors in this. And then there was a section in the book that just blew my mind where uh, they, they rattled off like 10 to 15 different authors and says, you know, they probably put out, you know, a thousand different writings each and we have nothing left you know, nothing left. Just so just imagine what's out there. We think we have all this and how much knowledge has just been gone. But I want to move well, forward. I, I was just going to jump in to quickly say, I, I think one of the things they mentioned is since Lucretius is, is so stricken with uh, Epicurus and Epicurean philosophy that, that almost everything of Epicurus is, is gone too. They have His, nothing. Not, yeah. very, very little. Yeah. It's just the philosophy. And then that's been sort of bastardized. But, but uh, yeah, I was amazed that Right. That, well, that's what I was going to get into next. So we have this uh, Poggio that um, it becomes kind of a, he, he worked for some popes and then it becomes kind of a adventure type seeking thing to find this new knowledge that was lost during the Middle Ages. It was uh, you could sell it, but he wasn't really out for the money. He just was out for like you to, to, to for the knowledge and to find what he could. And um and he goes out to, to, to find this and, and searches. He's from Italy. I think we, he ends up finding uh, on the nature of things by Lucretius. He finds it in Germany, I believe. In German in Abbey. Germany, in a German Abbey. Um, and he gets these epic, he gets these ideas like we've been talking about, about from Epicurus. And Epicurus, uh, his ideas, like you talked about, were so, I mean, this we're talking about 2,000 years ago, talking about atoms. Right. Yeah. Um, but I brought up some other uh, I, I wrote down some other his other ideas, um, his beliefs that obviously threatened the church. But he uh, he be believed that happiness was the key, um, that uh, humans should not dwell on death, that you should just dwell on personal happiness, um, that humans are a member of the animal kingdom, um, that there's a lack of divine in intervention. If there is a God kind of like. Uh, deism and this is where we're going to come in later where thomas jefferson got this idea it's probably epicurious uh um that a, the god, god kind of is like a, if there is a god he's a clock clock maker you know he's just setting the setting the clock Correct. the clock's going to move on himself atomism and so this poem comes out by uh paggio and he releases it to the world and it's one of the you know to take a movement like the renaissance there's going to be a lot of a few things you know you have the reformation and some other things in there but this is a major step to get the revel to get the renaissance moving um you obviously know about the artwork, artwork yeah i mean based I, on him go ahead I, I just think it's it's also worth mentioning pe people that are listening to because i remember it sticking out to me I, I've, I've been lucky enough to to spend some time in, in italy and in florence where poggio spent some of his time and, you know, you think of, of Poggio himself, this being a long, long time ago, this is 600 years ago. So you think of that as being a long time ago, but you don't realize that like um, these ancient writings were ancient to them as well. You know, like this, is, this was really old stuff. And, uh, you know, this is thousands, you know, this word Renaissance means rebirth. It's this, this renewed interest in the in this ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but yeah, this is a thousand four hundred years old stuff. Like this is, you know, I mean, what's six hundred years at that point, right? I mean, right. this is as almost as ancient to them as it is to you, and so but they're with a, but with a meaningful new message. Christianity brought the message that pleasure is going to come in the afterlife after your sacrifices, you know, and not that Christianity doesn't have a firm hold during the Renaissance. You know, a lot of these artists are are hired you know to paint religious scenes but they're also saying now from epicurean writing is pleasure's okay 
that should be your focus. And so you have a lot of artists saying, okay, you know, this is scholars and artists saying, I'm going to go this route. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with uh, the Black Death. Uh, <laughs> I saw your book collection. I, I, yes, they're, they're all sitting behind me here. Um, <laughs> nice. And, and, you know, I feel like that's worth mentioning for a moment because this is happening in the late 13, you know, 1347, 1348 is probably about the right time for the, the Black Death. And, and Poggio is 1417. So this isn't, you know, this is just a lifetime kind of, you know, right after that. And I think that really sets the stage for um, the Renaissance and, and humanism because it was uh, just like our own COVID-19 is kind of making people realize, hey, maybe we should be listening to science and what people are saying. At that time too, they began to realize that um, there might be some things listening to beyond just what the church is telling us and beyond the superstitions of the times. Scientific um, revolution is during this period too. Right? Correct. And it, it was it was the beginning of that. Um, you know, like I said, I feel like it's true that you know Greenblatt may simplify things, but it's only because you have to to tell to tell a story. But he's he it is a, a poem that's coming about that has these humanist ideas, um, but but part of what's giving them uh, helping them come to fruition is coming right after the Black Death, which is really open, you know, made people think about, you know, it seems like this world may be all there is. I've, all, all my, I've seen the just and the unjust dying at the same time. And, and then, like I said, short, right, very shortly after uh, Poggio pulls this out of obscurity, the printing press is invented in 1450. And that really allows the, the book to go viral, you know, for its time. Right. You know, I didn't think about the Black Death aspect, and it might have been in the book, but but you're right, it is fitting because they were so focused on death for a long time. And now you have this writer that comes out and says, hey, you cannot focus on death. And that was one of his main points is you can't think about death all the time. You have to worry about this in life. And as you're saying, it was fitting then and, and what they went through. And that's exactly what I wrote down on my notes here is it's fitting now. You know, uh, we're living in a state of a lot of people are living in a state of fear and worried and and. I'm not saying totally yeah. push it aside, but at the same time, for a healthier mindset, you cannot dwell on that. Epicurean, Epicurean philosophy is actually almost a little Buddhist in, in a sense. Like it is this idea of you have to let go of, of fear and, and these things that kind of uh, create these anxieties, uh, focus on your mindset now, you know, instead of these a pleasure and reward, uh, you know, reward and punishment afterwards. Um, it's, but, but then it gets, like I said, the, uh, the church did not, uh, Aristotle and Plato were a little bit easier to fit into their uh, Christian ideology sure. than this Epicureanism, but they painted the Epicureanism as hedonism. Like yep. this lust, like go out and, 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 you know, follow your lustfully desires, which is not really what he was saying at all. It was much yeah. more a, a moderation. It was a, it was more about the pleasures of the mind than the pleasures of the flesh. And it was not letting yourself take, taking you down that dark path. Exactly. Right. I don't look at it as hedonism as much as um, I think it was, if I remember correctly, Stephen Greenblatt in the beginning of the book, he, I think he tells an anecdote about his own mother. Do you yeah, this? Or, I think it's his grandma, or maybe his grandmother. Maybe it was his so mom. focused on death, his whole her whole life. Yes, and she ended up living to be ninety-two. And he looks at her and says, "All that," and, and I guess she pushed it on him too. You know, I, I right can't remember specifics. That's why you got to go read the book. But I can't remember the specifics. But exactly, he was saying, you know, this poor lady devoted so much thought and fear, right. and this was lacking you know and because it's not you know as much as i don't i think one of the things that got me about this book was uh i take a lot of epicurean or lucretius ideas and like the book says it it, it created our modern world i think of them as modern you, you know you do you, you think of like these things as uh coming of age new age to think that uh humans are on the same level as, as animals right to to say that we're all right here and and to believe that uh you know god doesn't intervene and to believe that 
um, you know, our true happiness is like you said, Buddhist Zen to be within yourself. You don't think of them as being right. BC. It's, you know? it's amazing how, and I think that's a really compelling experience too, to, to realize how uh, identifiable the voices are of these people that seem so deep back in time. Um, you, you get aspects of that. I mean, you know, Poggio himself wrote some lewd joke books uh, right. for the time period and stuff that, you know, you can kind of, um, you know, feel a certain modern relationship with. But they also talk about one of the uh, people that um, Lucretius influenced being Montaigne. Um, and the swerve led me to read a lot of other books. And one of them was I didn't read all of Montaigne's essays, but I, but I have the book of his complete essays. Okay. And Montaigne's amazing, amazing in that way too, where this is a 500 year old writer, you know, French writer. And it seems so, his, his thoughts and fears and personality seem so identifiable, relatable. Um, it's, it's, that, it is, it's It blows fast. your mind. No, it does. Well, you know, not to, to, to bring it up but uh i think there was a, a book from uh i read sapiens and he's it's going to be on an episode i'm going to talk about that if you, you read sapiens correct yes you, good. yes but just to bring that book in just for one second they said that essentially if you if you were to speak to somebody from i think it was 150 thousand years ago you know they'd have a conversation like we are right now and you don't expect that you know what right. i mean you really don't you just we expect that we're so far advanced but uh, Harari in his book said, no, you know, I mean, they were at the same point and you could, you, you, if you met one and they were here and put in the same, give them a couple of days to acclimate, but they're going to be the same. It's the same wild. Way. I know you, you, you know, you said that I uh, inspired you to read the swerve and you inspired me to read uh, Ishmael. Oh, good. And, yeah, that's right. And, and Ishmael was about, um, you know, the uh, agricultural revolution, you know, talk deals a lot with the changes, the fall that came from that. But I mean, you know, the agricultural revolution is 10,000 years ago. I, pretty, and for most places, written, you know, the written word doesn't go back much more than 5,000 years ago. Right. So, I mean, you, you even have 5,000 years of civilization of, of agriculture and buildings where there's no, there's, no, there's nothing nope. that's it's amazing. written about it. Um, it's it's just amazing to think of all that it, all that's been lost, and then yeah. of course in the book it talks about that the library in Alexandria where they just had, you know, just all, all of the ancient world stored there. I mean, what a it's just it's almost painful to read about what was in that library and what got and what lost. What was lost and what we have, yeah, it would probably blow our minds what was lost. You know, we we wonder about the pyramids and stuff. I mean, that could have all right. been right there, right? It really. So you, much was lost. It, it could have been at our fingertips. But the other thing that the book talked about too, which why were Poggio and these men so excited about to go to go learn about these things? And one of the things that struck me, and it was what you were just talking about, is at that point, so much of antiquity was around them. Roman bridges. Uh, uh, they were fascinated by it. Yeah, well, and they, but they didn't know anything. They couldn't learn about it. There was nothing out there to learn, so they'd have to go find the books to tell them about it. Aqueducts, all these things. We, we, you know, we come across very little, you know, of antiquity because it's been now two thousand years, right? But back then, when he was, it was, it was, it was all around him. I mean, these cities, there, there'd be crumbling churches or, or shrines to Mithra, you know, or whatever. Right. Um, and and they weren't allowed to ask. And that was one of the main things. They weren't right. allowed to ask. It was very mysterious. And, and even though there were obviously were remnants of it all around them, it's amazing how much of it was lost, truly lost to, to them too by that time too. Like that, like even in the, and during the Renaissance, they are doing archeology. span Like they are digging up these sculptures to be put in, Medici banking, you know, the bankers courtyards and it blew my mind, Steve, the part of the book too. I know you just don't, you don't, but when Rome conquered Greece, you know, Greece's time was up and how much Rome stole statues <laughs> and stuff from ancient Greece, you know, yeah, that, that for so long, they probably thought these were, these were Roman statues, but no Rome pillaged Greece. It's just, it's just a time period. I mean, that, that blew and, my and mind too. In the Renaissance, there was even a pretty uh, burgeoning 
uh, business in in creating uh, antiquity forgers. Um, in the and in, as well. in fact, if you've ever seen, um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, the Lao Cone or Laocoon, some people say Lao Cone, it's the sculpture of, um, it's, um, Lao Cone is the guy whose sons, it had something to do with the Trojan story and his kids are being eaten by this serpent that's wrapped oh, in. It's, it a very, it's at the Vatican and it's a very famous uh, sculpture, um, but it was dug up during um, Michelangelo's time in uh, during the Renaissance. And there is, there is, I've seen some, I don't know how um, debunked it is, but there's definitely been put forth the idea that the Pope had Michelangelo create that sculpture um, wow. because antiquities were such a big deal. And yeah. some art historians Popular felt like again. this style was more similar to, to Michelangelo than to what was really in, wow. in so that's an interesting little that's very interesting conspiracy well, theory and and, and that, so let's just get to our final point we, we talked about you know um lucretius writes the nature of things it gets lost on purpose and because of nature uh poggio finds this um it it, it gets spread out there he makes copies and it, it kind of helps spark the renaissance and sparks a lot of art movement sparks a lot of thought um, let's just talk about that a little bit. I thought one of the most interesting ones, I don't know if you remember this from the book, was uh, Thomas More's Utopia, uh, which is very famous. Uh, he, he writes this book, but I didn't know, and, and this is from Green, Greenblatt, Brad at least, um, Blatt at least, is that he was taking that from an Epicurean idea, but showing that God is still in charge. So, you know, from the church saying, hey, these new ideas are cool and all, you know, utopia, you know, pleasure is the key, but just remember, still on top is, is, is God. I thought that was the, interesting. The key to survival of any pagan idea was finding a way to make it, it in. dash, you know, and that's why, you know, you know, even your Christmas tree is a, is a pagan thing, but you know, your Yule log. Yeah. So all these things you got, you had to find a way to coexist. Yeah, I thought that was out. really interesting. And then, you know, um, other people that I just wrote down that that, that were, uh, I, you could call them, I don't know, I guess they, I guess automatically the Epicureans because Lucretia wrote the poem. And let me just show you real quick for people that didn't see. You can buy a copy now. This is On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. It is a, that's you got yours. There you go. Mine. That's a little different. A little different, but yeah. it's just a long poem. Yeah. Uh, have you have you read it through, Steve? I, I think I made it to here. It, it it's not the easiest thing. <laughs> I think I made it to page four or five. Yeah, um, it's and it's you difficult. know the funny thing is, um, you know, Stephen Greenblatt is an infinitely smarter man than I, and he admitted it was a struggle for him. It's a struggle, but I had and obviously since you have it, when you read this book, you feel that you have to have it. And, and yes, and I and I will agree. Well, Greenblatt did talk about how um, there are sections of that poem that are much more accessible than others. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's if you if you find the right spots, there are parts of the poem that you I think you can get into and, and enjoy and follow. But then you know sometimes it just goes down these roads where you're like, whoa. Um, I want to go back real quick before I talk about who we inspired. But I thought one more part that I missed that I thought was really interesting was Poggio was known for his handwriting. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and in fact, a, a whole form of script, I think, was right. he devised. He said, for so long, we've been too fancy. These words are right. running together and they have to connect. He's like, how about we make it so... What well, wasn't him. I think it was Patri Petrarch that started this movement, but said, let's make it so you can read it, right? And so... Poggio became so well known for his handwriting and actually the coolest what I thought was a really cool story is that's his handwriting is where Times New Roman is based on. Oh that's right that's right <laughs> and you know what's you know what what's also amazing when I've read about like early writing and early books is um in, in the very earliest forms of writing they I, I hope I get this right they had something that they the way they wrote was something called scripto continua or something like that right. and it was everything ran together there was no punctuation there was no capitalization so um have you ever read uh cormac McCart mccarthy 
I haven't. Or the road. He does the same, but go ahead. <laughs> he feels the same. He does, yeah. <laughs> but but I mean, you know, the, the ability to to um to get everything right when you're when you're passing books down from you know, not only switching from one language to another language, but sometimes there was, yeah, when you have no punctuation at all, uh-huh. it's pretty hard to to not to, to get a completely faithful. You know, that's interesting. And I never thought about, I didn't know that, but two of my favorite authors, Cormac McCart- McCarthy, who uh, I partially named my son after Cormac, and uh, Jose Saramago, who was a Nobel Prize winning author, they both do that. And it's really interesting. I never thought of why, but I bet if I had to guess, I bet that's the reason. I bet Some they want to go back. Connection to that. To that. But they, um, neither of them use uh, much punctuation at all. Just all runs together. And it takes, you know, at first it takes a minute to get used to because you're like, whoa, well, who's talking now? What's going on? But after a while, I mean, the flow is like nothing else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you get in and write it out. Um, but I wanted to just say, uh, though, the, the, the people that it inspired that were Epicureans, um, you just mentioned before uh, you re- he, that Greenblatt wrote a book about William Shakespeare. Uh, he says that William Shakespeare was very inspired by, uh, by this philosophy. Uh, Galileo, Galileo, his, one of his goal was, was to uphold that the earth was one of many, that we weren't special. And that came from Epicurean philosophy. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm bringing up Galileo makes me think of another uh, slight of obsession that I have, uh, which is, yeah, thinking about how this, how the, how the modern world was born and, and the scientific revolution, you know, you've you've got this looking back at, at the ancient world, you have the the Black Death happening in the late 1340s, 50s, and, and a series of plagues, you know, come. But this is re- you know this is a really bad one in the, in the 1347, 1348 time period. It makes people think a lot about w- what is the meaning of life. There doesn't seem to be um, yeah, like I said, the rain's falling on the just and the unjust. Uh, then, then you get books really starting to show up in the 1450s when the printing press comes around, and now they're everywhere. But in the early 1600s, when people get a hold of these books, they start to realize that they're nearsighted. Like people can't read; very, they've never read. There, there hasn't been a, a much of the population that was literate before. Right. So as literacy rates increase. The recognition that people have vision problems increases, and this this create this truly creates a demand for lenses, for better lenses, and so lenses start getting people are messing around with grinding lenses, and that's when you get in the 1600s, it's probably 1610, 1611 that 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 uh, Galileo is making his discoveries somewhere right around there, and these people are playing around with. Lenses. Lenses for, for your for your eyes. Galileo looks up into the sky and realizes there are things that we've never been told about by the, that didn't show up in the Bible or, or the ancient writings. And then Anthony von Leeuwenhoek in, in the Netherlands is using lenses to look to the microscopic world. And they said for 50 years, everything Leeuwenhoek saw through those lenses, he was the first person to ever see it. That's amazing. That's amazing, right? That's amazing, yeah. But this is all helping to, to give birth to that modern world because it's breaking those traditions. It's breaking those strongholds of this is, you know, this is truth and, and don't ask too many questions. That's great. Yeah, you never, th- it, not only is it reading and the information involved, but then, like you said, then everything that comes on top of the, the that had to go with it, that's that's crazy. Then the last one that I, uh, I and I'm sure there were more, um, but uh, an epi- the other Epicurean that we all know is Thomas Jefferson. And I thought it was really interesting. Those of you that, that know about Thomas Jefferson based uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, on another philosopher named uh, John Locke. Mm-hmm. And John Locke said that, hey, uh, you know, the natural rights of a human being are life, liberty, and property. And when Thomas Jefferson is writing the Declaration of Independence, uh, he was a wealthy landowner. And he had a little bit of, uh, you know, he, he wasn't all about saying that property was going to be uh, a right to all the people, uh, but he was an Epicurean too. And so I think it's really cool uh, that, you know, if he's not going to say that it's a, it's a right of, of Americans, which would have been cooler to say property, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he went with the, the pursuit of happiness, you know, which is a direct, I think that's just a really cool thing. I honestly did not know where that came from before. 
I thought he was just kind of throwing something out there that, and as much as I like Thomas Jefferson, I thought he was just throwing something out there that sounded good to appease the people. Uh, now that I know that it's from uh, uh, Epicurus, I think it's a lot, a lot cooler. I think it's just, you know, uh, Jefferson was intellectual curiosity and he, mm -hmm. he seemed to be someone who was willing to cobble his philosophy to get, take what he wanted from each philosopher. And I know he had his own Bible where he literally took out yeah. anything he didn't like. <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, and that's what we were talking about before is that's Epicurean too, right? Uh, Epicurus is the guy that said, uh, if there's a God up there, he's not dealing with your daily lives. Right. Um, which is what deism, right? Is that what that's yeah, called? yeah, 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 sure, and, right. And, and Thomas Jefferson and a couple of those founding fathers are the most famous deists, but it, right. it, that all probably goes back to, to him yeah. also. And yeah. like we said, to, to reiterate to people out there though, Epicurus, this whole thought, this whole belief system, uh, his all his writings are gone. And that's what's really cool about this On the Nature of Things by Lu Luc Lucretius is that it, a lot of it came back through uh, this complete uh, on the nature of things, but then also little pieces of other books that mentioned him uh, that we still have too, or that they, they found also, but yeah, piecing it together. There were two, if people are interested, there was, uh, like I said, I really, this book, one of the reasons I really loved it too, is it seemed to be a real jumping point to a lot of other uh, books that I kind of ended up reading. And again, they're all nonfiction. And, and I kind of was leaning towards the science aspect uh, of, of things, the making of the modern world. But uh, Thomas Dolnick's The Clockwork Universe is a really great book that I read after that. Okay. And, uh, and Carl Sagan's, I think it's The Demon Haunted World or Demon Haunted, I think it's A Demon Haunted World. Uh, those, both of those books I thought were incredibly interesting. Um, very readable for, you know, essentially science books. Have you read Homo Deus after Sapiens? I, I got about halfway through. I didn't put it down because it wasn't interesting. It's I think hard, it was it? during, as you and I know, my, my political obsession right now has gotten a little strong. So I find myself staring at Twitter a little too often. Yeah. Um, and it's really hurt my reading a lot. I'll, I'll tell you this, this uh, quarantine. And the reason I'm doing this right now is I, I, I find it very difficult to read. Uh, I, I posted this before. I don't know what it is. Um, I, I, I'm not outwardly scared. I'm not act outwardly anxious, but I think something subconsciously is not relaxing as much. Yeah. And so I cannot sit down and read. And so for me, I thought, well, how can I get back into books? And this talking about it is what I needed to do because, uh, you know, I, where I would spend several times a day sitting down for five to 10 minutes reading, I, I can't find if if I can lay down and get into a space and start, then then the calmness will kind of come over me and I can I can do do well and stick it out. But it is like particularly in the beginning, like it's a ramped up. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I've got a little uh, ADD of the times that exactly. it's affecting yep. me. Awesome. But I really so think I this is a really neat thing that you're doing. Um, and this is the first one that you're first one. You're it. Well, I appreciate, um, I feel honored to be a part of that. I apologize to everyone for the, the glow emanating you look great. You look from good. my head, I'm sure. <laughs> I have to get better. I'm a, I'm a photographer. I should have been better at lighting, but I really didn't prepare. <laughs> no, you did awesome. So uh, one thing I want to say, I want to say uh, thanks to Beth Brockman for my logo. She gave it to me. She does an awesome job. Uh, I don't think she's doing graphic design anymore, but she is awesome if she ever does get back into it. Uh, thank you, Steve, for coming out. Um, I would recommend this book, and I'm sure Steve would, to anyone. Yeah. Uh, definitely go get a copy. Um, be on the lookout. I'll probably have Steve back sometime, and I'm hoping yeah. to do these about once a week. Yeah, and be sure to drop me a line about the new book. You said he's this one about Adam and Eve. I will. I definitely check will. that out. But yeah, thanks. I look forward to, to seeing your future podcasts. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Steve. See ya. Bye. See ya.